Those who are weak, make them strong. Yeah. And anything that is hindering progress, we pray, Lord, will sweep everything away in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let the joy of the Lord be the strength of all the workers. Yeah. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Yeah. We're reading from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 20, verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned, have not neglected to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take each therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. We cheers but chased with his own blood. Tonight we're looking at the New Testament and the Old Testament, the Bible, on the church. You see in that verse 30, 28, it says, Take it therefore unto yourselves. Who was he talking to? Come back to verse 17. In verse 17, I'm from Miletus. He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. He called the leaders in the church. He called the ministers of the church. And then he revealed with them what God had helped him to do. He had set the standard. He had laid the foundation. He had prepared a model. And he had shown them how to minister, how to preach, how to pray, how to lead, how to counsel, and how to fully declare the counsel of God. And in coming to the conclusion, he said, Wherefore, I take you to record this day. He said, You can all be a witness that I am pure from the blood of all men. All men, meaning, number one, the ministers that he administered to, that he had trained, that he had taught, that he had transformed. All men concerning the sinners that heard the word from him. And he said, I'm pure from their blood because I did not hide from them what they ought to have heard. And he was saying, in all the places he had gone, in all the places he had taught, he was pure from the blood of all men. It's a challenge to you and challenge to me. That we should be able to say that we appear from the blood of all men, meaning all our neighbors. All men, meaning all the members of the church that come under our preaching, under our ministry. We appear from the blood of all men, all men that come across us. And we are the only people that can share the gospel with them. And then he said, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He said, I didn't take it the ministry like everybody's business, which is no man's business. I didn't say, well, if I don't cover that, Timothy will cover that. If I don't say that, Silas will say that. If I don't get through that, another person will get through that. He said, no, I made it my responsibility as if I was the only one that could teach the word of God unto the people. I made it my own assignment that if I were the only one they will ever listen to, they will hear everything they ought to hear. He was saying, I didn't specialize in just one area and say, well, my ministry is on the rapture. My ministry is on eschatology. My ministry is only on a salvation. My ministry is only on holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. He said everything completely. I have not shunned, I have not neglected to, to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says everything from A to Z. Everything from the foundation to the very zenith have declared unto you. Now he passed it unto them. And he's passing it to you today. He, he succeeded. You will succeed. He was able to do the same grace available to Paul the Apostle. Available to the little me in front of you. That same grace is available unto you. Every help you need, he will give. 
all the support you need he will give you and then he says now because he has helped me and the lord is going to help you i think i was talking to somebody there he says take it therefore unto yourselves he says first of all think about yourself and then you take it unto yourself and then to all the flock that is don't uh, kind of overlook anybody in the flock and don't say that one is poor that one is too knowledgeable that one is a university candidate that one is this that one is that i cannot treat that i cannot talk to that one it says take it unto all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you overseers had made you ministers had made you pastors had made you teachers to feed the church of god to feed the church of God. Brothers and sisters, what are we to do to the church? Feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. As we think about the true church, the true church is God's own church. God's own church, comprising of all who have turned away from their sins and they have trusted Christ for salvation. And they are added to the Lord. They are added unto the Lord. Understand that the true church is not, uh, you know, some scattered people that are roaming about, that are wandering about, that belong to no congregation. They belong to no assembly. They're just like rolling stones that do not gather any good thing. No, not at all. They are added unto the Lord. Uh, look at this, um, uh, chapter 2, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. And uh, we are reading from verse 47. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. What did he do? He added to the church such as should be saved. You know, there are some people that will say, I believe I'm a child of, I'm, I'm part of the church, the true church, only I don't belong to any local assembly. All the local assemblies are bad. There are, there are a lot of hypocrites there. Look at that one, look at that one, look at that one. Because of that, I'm not part of the church. Hey, look at this in the Acts of the Apostles. And you have heard about Ananias and Sapphira great hypocrites in fact they died for their hypocrisy but the people that were really converted they didn't say i can't join any church because you know there's one ananas there and i said one sapphira there no even though there are there may be hypocrites in the visible church you as a child of god you know that you ought to be part of the church because the lord added unto the church such as should be saved and then when you come to Samaria, you see the people in Samaria with great joy, they receive the word of God. And then somebody is saying, I don't want to join the church because, you know, there's, I, I can't tell you about all those people. Some of them say, we're born again, we're born again. And then we discover that one Simon. And Simon wanted to buy uh, the gift of God with money. There you are. That's why I can't join the church. Nobody said that in the New Testament. They knew that whoever is there, whoever is not there whether they are up or they are down there are some hypocrites there but thank god there are saints there as well and so they decided that since i'm born again i'm going to be part of the people of god because the lord added unto the church but look at this acts chapter 11 in acts of the apostles chapter 11 i'm reading now from verse 24 acts chapter 11 verse 24 for he was a good man and full of the holy ghost and of faith and much people was added tell me unto the lord you see that on one side they are added to the church on the other side they are added unto the lord both must take place both must take place that he, is, uh, he has repented from sin, is born again, he has trusted in the Lord, he is added unto the Lord. The Lord has accepted him and the Lord has embraced him and the Lord calls him, that's my son, that's my daughter, is added unto the Lord. On the other hand, is also added unto the church. And so that means the true salvation, that is the universal church, reaching in heaven, known in heaven, and identified by the Lord himself. That universal church, that means all people who are born again, 
all over the world. All people who are born again in any denomination, all people who are born again in any church, all of them together, all of us together, Christ is the head of that church. The church is the body of Christ. They are regenerated souls. They are called out of sin, called out of the world, called out of evil, called out of darkness, and they are cleansed by his blood, and they are kept righteous by his power. Now, that's the invisible church, the true church. There is the visible church. It's not just the building. Those of us who are here tonight, if we were a single congregation, a local congregation, and we can tell, that's brother so-and-so, that's sister so-and-so there, that's my boy there, that's my little daughter there, because we can see you are visible. That is a visible church. And the visible church, in the visible church, you have quite a lot of people. There are some in the visible church that are ignorant. Visible church. There are some in the visible church that are happy. There are some in the visible church, they are sick. There are some, of the visible, some in the visible church, they are backslidden. Some in the visible church are not even really born again. That's visible church. The invisible church, all are born again. And you don't know them. Because their names are written in heaven. That's the true church, the invisible church. It's a mystery. And those are the people that really totally fully belong to the Lord. But the visible church is like a mixture. That's the local church. That's the city church. That's the national church. Of all denominations, the good and bad are there. The spiritually dead, spiritually alive are there. The worldly and the godly are there. They are all included in the visible church. The true church, the invisible church, is made up of those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And let's come to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, we'll see the visible church, the local church, the denominational church, the city church, or the national church, visible. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 1. Unto the angel of the church, Christ called this uh, assembly church, church in Sardis, right? This thing says he that has the seven spirits of God that, and, and the seven stars. I know thy words that thou hast a name that thou livest and tell me are dead. You see, that's the church, but that's local church. That's the city church, the church in Sardis. That's a church that is visible and some of them were dead spiritually, but it's still a church. Look at it now from verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and that are ready to die. That is, some of them still remain. They are not dead here, but they are ready to die. Other people are completely, totally dead. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. That's the pastor there. His ministry was not perfect. His ministry was not acceptable to the Lord, but he's still the pastor. And he's the angel of that church. is the minister, the leader in that church. And then the members too, you know, quite a lot of them are backsliding, quite a lot of them on the verge of backsliding and some of them were remaining. Look at verse 3. Remember therefore how thou was received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch and uh, I will come on, on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. There was a few names seven in Sardis. You see that now? Those ones, they were born again and Christ recognized them. That's part of the visible church. Now these few people that are recognized by Christ, they are part of the invisible church and they also belong to uh, the visible church in Sardis. And it says, now has, um, now has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are 
worthy. A lot of unworthy people there in the visible church, but a few people are worthy there in that same visible church. Which tells us that in a visible church, in a local church, in a city church, or in any part of any assembly, there may be people there who are born again and others who are not born again. They are still to be born again. Those of us who are leaders, we should understand that those people need ministry. They need the word of God. They need to be convicted of their sin, come out of their sin so that they will know the Lord. Look at verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Those who have their names in the book of life, those are part of the visible church. They belong to the visible church they belong to the invisible church. We're coming to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, and there shall no one in no wise enter into it, into heaven. Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination. You see, there are people, they belong to the visible church. And because of the name of their church, deeper life, because of the name of their church, uh, you know, the unique uh, church, because of the name of their church, the church of Christ, because of the name of their church is the church of God, because of the name of their church is the church of grace, because of that name, a good name, a good name, they think the name will qualify them to get to heaven. No, they're just part of the visible church, and uh, the visible church may have a good name, a great name, a popular name and an interesting name that doesn't get anybody to heaven look at this it says and there shall in no wise enter into enter into it any sin anyone that defileth neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are reaching in the lamb's book of life those are part of the true church those who are reaching in the Lamb's book of life. And that's the church. And that's the church Christ is coming from. I pray you'll be a part of that church. Tonight we are looking at the message. Fulfilling God's purpose for his own church. Fulfilling God's purpose for his own church. We're talking about the true church now. And then those true church, the true church, they're all divided and scattered in the visible churches and in the local churches and the city churches, fulfilling God's purpose for his, for his own church. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the picture of the typical church in the wilderness. The picture of the typical church in the wilderness. What that means is that we're looking at this example of the church and it's a typical church. When you see a typical church, look at that church very well. Look at what happened in that church and then look at all the churches. The possibility is that what happened to that church can happen to all the other churches, the churches of today. Because it's a typical church, it's a type of the church that you're looking at today. The picture of the typical church in the wilderness. Point number two, the pollution of the trampled church by the world. You see, the church is in the world. And the church can keep afloat. The church can keep pure. The church can keep clean. The church can depend on the grace of God and the world will not trample on the church. But if the boat that is on the sea has leakage, the water that should, uh, the boat should normally be on top of the water and should not affect the boat, but that leakage can so affect the boat that the water comes into the boat and then the boat will sink, will come under the water. The same thing with the church. The church is in the world. And we're here to minister, we're here to evangelize, we're here to bring a people out of the world into Christ. But if we allow the world 
to come through the cracks in the church and to come through the carelessness in the church and to come through the compromise in the church, coming to the church, then the church will sink in the world. And that's how pollution comes to the local church, the pollution of the trampled church by the world. Number three, the preservation. You'll be preserved. Yeah. Our churches will be preserved. Yeah. We'll remain part of the true church in Jesus' name. The preservation of the true church in his word. The preservation of the true church in his word. We're coming to point number one. Tell me number one over there. The picture of the typical church in the wilderness. What does that mean? Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 37 and verse 38. Acts chapter 7 verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. What was Moses saying? Moses was saying, uh, what we have, the assembly we have here, this is not the final assembly. God has raised me up, and we are a type of what will still come. The real sin uh, will still come. The real church will still come. And the true church will still come. The one that will comprise not only Israelites, but all over the world, that will still come. And the one that will be the head of that church, like I'm over you, the head over Israel, he is still to come. And he's a prophet like unto me. And he will speak the word unto you. And then it says, him shall ye hear. Look at verse 38. Now this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. It's referring to the children of Israel that came out of the land of Egypt. Called out people. They were called out. To the people who were redeemed by the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. They are the people that the Lord brought unto himself. He purchased them unto himself. That's the church in the wilderness. It's just like the church today. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Because the cleansing of our soul and the forgiveness of our sin is by the blood of the Lamb. Behold the blood, the, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. And, so, and it says that when we are purchased, we belong to him. You don't belong to yourself. Just like those children of Israel. And so he said, this is sin. That was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, what do we learn about that church? That church in the wilderness. We're coming to Exodus. Exodus, we're reading from chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Look at what we're learning about that church so we can learn what we need to know about this church, the church now. In Acts chapter 19, reading from verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. You see that? He brought them out and he brought them unto himself. Do you remember what we have learned since we started just a few minutes ago? That the people that turned to the Lord, they were added unto the Lord. Added unto the Lord. And the same thing here, they were brought unto himself. Look at verse 5 now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, remember the words of Jesus, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That church in the Old Testament, the church in the wilderness, is a type, it's an example, it's a lesson for us who are living today. And keep my commandment, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Look at verse 6, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Look at that. 
the church in the wilderness not the church over there uh, at the time of Moses it says they were to be priests and kings unto the Lord himself and holy nation uh, let's come to first Peter first Peter and see what the Lord is telling us about the church now in first Peter chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, we're looking at uh, verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us here, it says, But here, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, exactly what the Almighty God told the children of Israel, that that's what they were. We are now the people, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, called you out, called you out. That's ecclesia. Ecclesia is called you out, out of darkness, into his marvelous light. So that's who we are. But let's come back now to Exodus again. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're looking at the typical church. That is the church, which is a type for the church of today. Exodus chapter 32, reading from verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. You see that? That church, the typical church, the names were written in the book of life. And immediately they came out of the land of Egypt and they gave their heart to the Lord. My son, give me that heart. The same thing, the same thing. They were saved, they were redeemed, they were forgiven, and they were cleansed by the blood of the sacrifice lamb, the Passover lamb. But now he said, any one of them that sinned against him, he will blot out their name out of the book he had written. Let's come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. The typical church in the wilderness, with many of them, God was not well pleased. Think about the church today, the visible church of today. With many of them, God is not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Look at what happened. Now, these things were reaching for our examples. The church in the wilderness is a lesson to the church of today. The church of that old time is a lesson to the church of this generation. Now these things were our example to the intents we should not lose after evil things as they also lost it. Look at verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are reaching for our admonition. We cannot say, well, the church or in the wilderness, uh, we don't have any concern about that. It doesn't concern us because we are now a new generation. There's new covenant. It says, no, all those things happened unto them. For example, and they're reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That is, until the end of the world, that church, what happened to them, must always be a lesson for us, and we must always learn so that uh, bad things will not happen to you. What do we learn about uh, that other church? There are three, I, I put them here and I atomize them so that it will be easy for you to remember. Number one, the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption. The Lord gave a plan and it was the plan of redemption. What was the plan of redemption for them? Exodus chapter 12 verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the, of the land of Egypt, in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, tell me, 
I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you uh, to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That was the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption. Look at chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 11. Exodus chapter 15 verse 11. It says who is like unto thee, O Lord among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holy fearful in praises doing wonders thou hast stretched out thy right hand they have swallowed them now in thy mercy they were saved by mercy not by works in thy mercy has led forth the people whom thou hast tell me redeemed they were redeemed they were saved they were forgiven and were brought unto the lord it says which thou hast redeemed and has guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation the plan of redemption number two the provision for their righteousness the lord provided for them so that as they were redeemed they would also be righteous the same thing god does for us today we repent of our sins and we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and we're now children of God and he makes provision for our righteousness so that we don't get saved uh, by grace and then live the life, the next uh, the life we're living now by struggling, by personal effort. It's still there's provision for our righteousness. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, uh, chapter 20, verse 7, Leviticus. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. It, sanctification for them was also the work of grace. I am the Lord that sanctify you. Look at verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you, separated you, taken you away from the other people, that ye should be mine. The provision for their righteousness. Number three, now, the preachers of divine revelation. They are preachers too. And the preachers mattered a lot. Just like today, the preachers today matter a lot. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 9, and this is where you come in. That although the people are saved, although the people have been brought to the Lord, if you don't do your duty and preach the word of God, divine revelation, the way it ought to be preached, then the people might lose out. The people may actually be misled. Isaiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15, the ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. As you look at the visible church today, and you look at many denominations, many local churches, we're not just talking about deeper life, we're talking about all the local churches everywhere. On that street, there's a church. In that corner, there's a church. In that community, there's a church. In that local government, there's a church. In that region there, there's a church. In that state, there's a church. All over the nation, we have churches. And it says, the leaders, the prophets that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Look at verse 16. For the, for the leaders of these people cause them to err. They cause them to go astray. They that are led of them are destroyed. And so you find that although there was provision for their redemption, although there was provision for their righteousness, their teachers, their preachers, many of those uh, preachers, they led the people astray. In fact, it tells us in Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 7. It says, for the priest leaves should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but he had departed out of the way. That was the problem with the church in the wilderness. And that's the problem with many churches today. They're preachers, they're leaders. Their teachers, Sunday school teachers, and the people that lead them, and their priests, they, uh, they have gone out of the way. Ye have 
caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all thy all the people as you look at the church in the world today uh, you find that uh, many of the pastors don't have any respect they don't have self-respect they don't respect themselves and the people don't respect them uh, they know that it's just for profession it's for money making it's for business it's for commerce and you can tell the you know if you look at uh, you know the internet and all that how they talk about uh, their pastors and they write about their pastors and the things they say they make just because they've lost the respect of the people and God says they became contemptible. Look at that verse 9 again. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways but have been partial in the law partial in the law. They are not like Paul the Apostle that said, I've declared unto you the whole counsel of God, all the counsel of God. They are partial. Either they want to talk about uh, specializing you know, this area, specializing this area, specializing that area. They are not declaring the totality of the word of God. What's the consequence upon the congregation? Number four now, their perversion through rebellion. Their perversion through rebellion. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. They are rebellion. These uh, members of the churches today, various churches, the visible church, there is the perversion through rebellion. It says the ox knoweth is a owner, and the ass is a master's grip. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider a sinful nation, a people leading with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corrupters. They have forsaken the Lord and they have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backwards. You see, that's the condition of many visible churches today because their pastors mislead, mislead them. They won't talk about repentance. They won't talk about restitution. They won't talk about righteousness. And uh, when they steal money from either bank or steal money from anywhere and they come to give offering, all that concerns them is the offering that comes in. They don't care where the people have got uh, the offering from. And because of that it says, look at this, they have rebelled against the word of the Lord. Look at Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 20, we're reading from verse 5. The perversion through their rebellion. It says in verse 5, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, in the day when I chose Israel and lifted up my hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt when I lifted up my hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. In that day that I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I espied for them, that is, I searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then I said unto them, Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord, but they, what did they do? They rebelled against me and would not hack in unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then said I, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. And so you see uh, what is happening today. The same thing that happened to the church in the wilderness that 
that uh, although there was a plan of redemption, when I said the blood I will pass over you, although there was a provision for their righteousness, he made them holy, brought them to himself. Their preachers, in revealing the divine revelation, did not keep faithful and true to the word of God, and the consequence, their perversion through rebellion. Number five, uh, the proclamation of repentance. God will still not leave them alone in that situation. And so he sent people to them to proclaim repentance unto them. We're reading from Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 14. And we're looking at verse 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God. What's the next word there? Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. You see, as they rebelled and went away from the Lord, the Lord will not leave them alone. He still sent to them and said to repent. That's exactly what the Lord is doing today. And, you know, we preach over the radio repentance. We preach over television repentance. We preach uh, transmission repentance. We preach uh, third uh, uh, weekend uh, revival repentance. We preach every time, everywhere repentance because many of the pastors out there they are not telling their people repent but God is sending you out am I talking about you there I say God is sending you out and then you are going to tell the people they will not remain in their sin. They will not remain in their rebellion. You tell them, repent. And thank God, those who hear and believe, they repent and God will forgive them. Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 18, we're reading here from verse 30. It says, therefore I will judge you, house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord. Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. That's what he wanted, and that's what, what he still wants today. They have gone away in their rebellion, and they had a kind of a, made a mess of their redemption because now they were backslidden. And God said, Everyone that sins against me, I will remove him out of the book of life, a preaching. And these ministers now came back to them, to the children of Israel, repent and turn yourselves from all. All your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin, cast away from you. All your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die? Who? O house of Israel, their salvation was not eternal security. You know, there are people that say, once you are saved, you are forever saved. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And they came out of Egypt, and they came to the Lord, and the Lord even said, I'm the Lord that sanctify you. And now in their rebellion, he says, they will die if they did not repent. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God, Therefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Number six, the pronouncement of rejection. The pronouncement of rejection. When they had the word of repentance, instead of repenting, they didn't repent, many of them. And because of that lack of, uh, lack of um, repentance, they were rejected. In Second Kings chapter 17, Second Kings Chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 15. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 15. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charge them that they should not do like them. You see, there, are, there were many of them. They continued, well, we, we worship God. We go there every Sabbath day. We go there every weekday. We're still praying to the Lord. We're serving the Lord. And instead of repenting, they wouldn't repent. Just like many people today, because you see that church, the church in the wilderness is a typical church. 
It, uh, it makes us look at the other churches and see exactly what they are doing. Look at verse 33. Verse 33 of that same, um, that same uh, chapter. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. You see that? On the one hand, they feared the Lord. And, but on the other hand, they served their own gods. After the manner of the nation's tomb, they carried away from this unto this day. They do after their former manners. You know, we go to church. I have my own church. I have my own denominations. In fact, I'm a leader there. I'm a preacher there. But look at this. Although they go to church, although they say they have their own uh, assembly, it says until this day, they do after their former manners. They fear not the Lord in the real sense. Neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and the commandment which the Lord commanded the, uh, the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And also in verse 19, also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord. They are gone. But watch in the statutes of the of Israel, which they made. And the Lord, in verse 20, what did he do? Rejected all the seed of Israel. You see, it's a typical church. And the people of today, if they don't repent, I go to church, I go to church. I go to this, I go to that. If there's no repentance, if there's no change in their lives, the Lord rejects them. Because, you see, there's a pronouncement of rejection. Look at Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 6. The pronouncement of rejection. In Hosea chapter 4, reading from verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In many of, uh, you know, at that time, uh, in the church, in the wilderness, they had other things. They had celebration. They had rituals. They had ceremonies and everything. But the word of God was lacking. The same thing you find in the churches today, all those nominational churches, they say we're going to church, they may spend hours, hours there, they're dancing, they're singing. We're not just talking about uh, the local churches, about the African churches, we're talking about Pentecostal churches, charismatic churches, and they dance and they do quite a lot of things, and then when the time of the word of God comes, they're already tired, they cannot hear the word of God. That's why it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because they have rejected that was rejected knowledge I will also reject thee when we reject knowledge the knowledge of the word of God and we say well we want to make uh, you know the church acceptable to the young people and young people don't need too many verses of the Bible pastor uh, this uh, new generation we're going to hand over the church to these uh, younger people and the younger people don't uh, you know they sleep when you read this and go from Genesis to Revelation and to Psalms and to Proverbs and Ezekiel and Isaiah don't you know the young people are there the young people want to music they want young people they want dancing the young people they want to worship and they want us to on sunday rise up and you know spend time you know boys and girls and mama and papas and you know and then we we'll say we we'll rejoice before the lord and there's no time for the word of god again that's why those churches fail that's how those churches collapse what kind of church do you want to hand over to the youth what kind of church do you want to hand over to the younger people the church that has no words the church that has no interest in the word of God. Look at this. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou was rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee that thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I also will forget thee. I pray that will I forget thy children. That will not happen to us. Did I hear a good amen there? 
We're looking at Hosea chapter 8, Hosea chapter 8, and here I'm reading from verse 3. Hosea chapter 8, verse 3, Israel has cast off the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. They, they were still going through their worship, they were still going here and there, and were still trying to worship God, but they rejected the word of God. Israel has cast off the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. Look at verse 12, verse 12, I have reached unto him the great things of my law, the great doctrines of my word, and they were counted as a strange thing. You see, if you don't talk about repentance for years, and one day you wake up, you say, let's talk about repentance, it will look strange. You never mention holiness regularly, and then one day you say, okay, this is bad, this is bad, this church has gone too far, and then you come and say, today, today, we're talking about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They look at him and say, ah, when did you become deeper life? It's only deeper life we know that is talking about holiness every time it will look strange unto them you've never heard about the rapture you've never heard about the great tribulation you've never heard about the great white throne judgment and then and we've been in the church for 10 years for 15 years you've never spoken about that and then you just wake up you read something somewhere and say today i must give it to the people it will look strange and i pray the word of god will not be like that here will not be stranger to any of us in Jesus name I have reached unto him the great things of my law but they were counted as a strange thing for the children of Israel number one the plan of redemption number two tell me the provision for their righteousness number three what's that the preachers of divine revelation number four the perversion through their rebellion number five the proclamation of repentance, number six. The pronouncement of rejection, number seven. The punishment for reprobates. The punishment for reprobates. So we're looking at Psalm 7, and I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 7, reading from verse 11. The punishment for reprobates. We're looking at Psalm 7, verse 11. It says, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. All those uh, Israelites that were saved by the blood, all those Israelites that heard the word of God from Moses, from Joshua, and from all their other preachers and the priests, all those Israelites, as they went away from the Lord, it says God was angry with them and God is angry with the wicked. How often? every day look at some 9 verse 17 some 9 verse 17 the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The wicked shall be turned into hell. All those people that backslid and God said, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book, which I have written. All those people eventually they went to hell. Our churches will not go to hell. Your members will not go to hell. We must teach them the word of God and make sure we emphasize the word of God so that what happened to the church in the wilderness will not happen unto us. We're coming to point number two, the pollution of the trampled church by the world. The pollution of the trampled church by the world. And we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 20. It says, For if after they, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see that? When we became saved, we became born again, we escaped the pollution of the world, all the laws we escaped. It says, if they're again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That is, if after we have been saved, we have been born again, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. After that, we go back to those same pollutions because of the influence of the world. It says uh, the latter end is worse with such people than the beginning. How does that happen? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 5. 
5 verse 13 it says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 ye are the salt of the earth but if the salt have lost its savor, that's possible, that's possible that the salt will lose its savor, its saltiness. The, the salt will lose its value, will lose its worth. And it's because of the world coming in, eroding into the church. The pollutions of the world coming in and the carelessness of the world coming in. And then the people, the preachers are not serious about preaching the word of God and declaring the whole counsel of God. It says here, the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden, the same word, trodden, trampled, trampled under the foot of men. How is that? James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. James chapter 4, reading from verse 4. When the world comes in, when you allow the world to take over, when the people who are not born again, the people who are not really, they don't know the word of God, and they don't have the experience of salvation, and they don't have the conviction that if you sin, you know, God will be angry with you. They are just there, and they are given opportunity by, you know, their church management, their church leadership, uh, you take that, that, you take that just to keep them. You know, that's what some of those churches do. They'll give uh, somebody who is not really sure of salvation, who is not really sure of uh, being born again, who is not sure of having real conviction, and who does not fear God, does not fear sin in the, you know, private by himself, by herself. They make him a pastor there, make her a pastor there, make this one assistant pastor, make this one, uh, you know, associate pastor, make this one this and that. And they don't have any conviction and there's no conversion and the world comes in like that and then the whole congregation is at a loss because you know the people there what do they know and the people over here what do they know look at uh, james chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 4 uh, james chapter 4 verse 4 ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with god whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You see that that's how uh, those uh, churches become uh, polluted. The word of God is corrupted. We're coming to Second Corinthians chapter two verse seventeen. Second Corinthians chapter two verse seventeen. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. In many of the churches, they will read the verse of scripture. And then they will corrupt it. They will misinterpret it. They will give their own idea into it. In other places, they don't even bother to open the Bible. They just say, according to Isaiah chapter 35 verse 3. And then they will say what it says. And the people will not open the Bible. And the man that is saying according to Isaiah this and that. Is not reading exactly the same thing to them. And because of that there is low level of understanding. And it says uh, over here. We are not as many who corrupt the word of God. It's the corruption of the word of God. In many of those visible churches. Local churches that make the people to go astray. But it says but we of sincerity i pray you'll be sincere I, it says but as of god in the sight of god we speak in christ we do everything we do we preach as in the sight of god as if god if god were to be there physically and god is watching god will say that's right that's my word that's right that's the right interpretation that's right that's the right emphasis when we preach that's what we need to take to heart and we'll make sure that we're preaching it uh, to god's approval if we're looking at second uh, second corinthians chapter 13 uh, and i'm reading from verse 30, uh, chapter 11 verse 13 second corinthians chapter 11 verse 13 he said for such are false apostles false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of christ and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed uh, 
as the ministers of righteousness, whose end is according to their, shall be according to their works. You know, there are people the same way are gospel churches, but are they preaching the gospel? Where well, Pentecostal churches, how Pentecostal are they? And we are Bible believing churches. How much of the Bible do they believe? How much of the Bible do they preach? It says they transform themselves to an ancient, to angels of light, and then they deceive the people. That's how corruption has come into the churches. And that's how the churches are falling. They are falling from the New Testament standard, and I pray it will not happen here. We're looking at a second, a second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 1. But these are false prophets, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. As there shall be false teachers among you. There were in the past, in the church, in the wilderness. And then there shall be in the church of the New Testament false teachers among you who privily, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them denying the Lord. They deny the Lord, the authority of the Lord, the position of the Lord, and the centrality of the Lord, and the exaltation of the Lord. And their people look up to them and see if, um, you know, they are the originator of salvation. And their people would look up to them as if they are the final authority. And if they are doing anything, and you read the Bible, you say, look at this, you say, our pastor said, if they go this way and you say, but my friend, look at this and look at this without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. You say, I hear you, but our pastor said, and that pastor has replaced Christ, has replaced the word of God. And it says, they deny the Lord that bought them and they bring damnable, uh, damnable uh, heresies. It says, look at verse 2, and many shall follow the pernicious ways. You think they will not have converts? Of course, they are followers. And it says, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, you know, if you look at churches today, receive money, receive money. And they're not raising money for transportation to go to church. They're not raising money to build a local church. They're raising money to maybe serve themselves, to enrich themselves. And to, because, you know, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. If I'm not richer than those people of the world, what's the use of saying I'm serving the Lord? And how can I show the glory of the Lord and the care of the Lord if I don't have much more than those politicians have? And they raise this money just for themselves. But it says over here, and through covetousness, they shall, uh, with thin words, uh, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. What happens to these churches? How did they become derailed? The reason they became derailed, number one, the love of money. What did you hear? Look at First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. And you need to check up. We're not just talking about the people out there. You need to check up your own heart. I need to check up my own heart. Why am I a minister? Why am I a preacher? Am I corrupting the word of God? Are you corrupting the word of God? Are you leading people astray? What are you really doing? What's your influence on the church? And what's your authority in the church? And what is your uh, kind of the result of your ministry in the church? They are derailed because number one, the love of money. It tells us in chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Can we read that together? One, two, three, go. If you shift your attention to money and you, you shift away from the salvation of the people, you shift your attention away from, you know, how they will get to heaven and how you will get to heaven. If money becomes number one in your heart, you are going to go into evil. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Look at Second Peter chapter 2 chapter 2 
In 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 15. Which are forsaken the right way and are gone away following, gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Loved the wages of unrighteousness. Number two, the love of self the love of self. They love self more than they love Christ. So there's no self-denial. How are they going to deny themselves when they were, you know, those uh, days we used to be like this and be like that, self-denial, self-denial. But you know now, we must take care of ourselves. We must live good and live well and live a luxurious life. Love of self. And if anyone is like that, you cannot try this of the Lord with all your heart. You look at Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse uh, chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. That's the problem. If somebody is is a, you know, a preacher, is a pastor, is a so-called prophet, or is this and that, and all he's thinking about is myself, myself, my family, my children, my wife, my husband, and how we're going to make it. And then, if I live, if I die, what will go to my children? What will go to my family? If that is the consideration, you will not be faithful to the word of God because number one, there's the love of money. Number two, there is the love of self. Number three, the love of pleasure. Pleasure, love of pleasure. Look at uh, chapter 3, that same uh, second, second Timothy, chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 4. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, uh, but denying the power thereof. What follows there? Say it aloud. I pray you'll be able to do that. Yeah. You know, there are some people, uh, this, I, I know these people are wrong, but you know, I, I'm in the habit of watching them over the internet. I'm in the habit of, you know, here and there and there and there. I don't agree with everything they say. I don't agree with what they're doing, but you know, I just like them. You like evil. It says from such Turn away. Number four is the love of praise. The love of praise. We're coming to John chapter 12, verse 43. John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 43. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The praise of men more than the praise of God. Look up here for a moment. If you are a pastor, if you are a leader, if you are an overseer, and you are too near the politicians, and you don't want the you don't want the politicians to you know look down on you. You want the politicians to say that you know it's a good pastor. We used to know deeper life, deeper life of you know. They will say when I was uh, in secondary school, I used to hear about deeper life, and those deeper life people, they'll never come near anybody because heaven, 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 holiness, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. But you know, nowadays the deeper life of today is a very different, I don't know about that deeper life, the deeper life of today here in my heart is still the same. Yeah. I pray your heart shall still be the same. Yeah. You know what politicians will say, but now you know, they are very near us. They don't condemn us anymore. We steal money. We even give them part of money. We steal and you know, they accept and say, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, your excellency. But if you're a real child of God, you will not love the praise of men. And you know, if you are preaching, and then you know that people have marriage problems there, marriage challenges there, you cannot talk about that because, you know, if you talk about that, they will not appreciate you. You want appreciation, and you want the praise. And Jesus said that they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's why many of the churches are derailed. I pray that this church will not be derailed in Jesus. Jesus name. Number five is the love of 
preeminence, love of preeminence, love of power, love of position, love of authority, that I call the shots. I am the final word, I'm the final authority, whatever I say, that is final. And they like to direct everybody, control everything. And they're not spiritual, and yet they want to have the preeminence. Look at Third John, the love of preeminence. That's what's killing the churches. And I pray that that will not be in our hearts in Jesus' name. In Third John, it's only one chapter. I'm reading from verse 9. Verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He loveth to have the preeminence. He loveth to be the number one. He loveth to be the final authority. He wanted to be in charge and in control. And because of wanting the preeminence, if anything doesn't go his way, doesn't go her way, it will not come into the church. If any teaching, any preaching will not go the way he wants or the way she wants, he will not want to allow that. You see, that's what is ruining the churches because there are some people there, they are stationed in those local churches. They are kind of in the corner there in those uh, local churches and uh, when they are watching their preachers, they know how to, you know, get the preeminence. If those churches do not recognize their preeminence, uh, some things will happen. Eventually, those, those uh, preachers, they'll succumb. They'll compromise. And I pray that that will not happen here. It will not happen through you. It will not happen through me. The word of God will remain high above everyone in the church in Jesus' name. Number six is the love of the world. The love of the world. We're looking at First John chapter 2 verse 15. First John chapter 2 verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what is killing the churches. Those, physical, those local churches and and those visible churches, the love of the world. Look at Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four, and I'm reading here from verse ten. Second Timothy chapter four, verse ten. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And then number seven. Oh, is that number seven already? Number one is the love of money. Number two, tell me, is the love of self. Number three, what's that? Love of pleasure. Number four, the love of praise. Number five, the love of preeminence. Number six, the love of the world. And then number seven, the love of sin and falsehood. The love of sin and falsehood. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, reading from verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. It's false. It's wrong. It's erroneous. It's false doctrine. It's something that leads astray. It's something that corrupts the church. It's something that misinterprets the word of God. And yet my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? Look at Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 14. I'm reading here from verse 10. It says, Thus says the Lord unto these people, those are they loved to wander. They loved to wander. They wander here, they wander here, they wander here. Um, you know, they come to deeper life uh, one day, then they come to, they go to shallow life another day, then go to valley life another day, then they go to fellowship life. And they wander about. They love to wander. And they, they don't have the heart for the truth and the heart to have the sincerity and the totality of the word of God. It says, Thus says the Lord unto these people, they have loved to wander, they have not refrained their feet, they waka, waka, waka about. And it says, uh, therefore, the Lord does not accept them, and he will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. We're looking at John chapter 3, verse 19. John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 19. Here are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And he's giving the reason why some people 
people don't stay with the truth because they love error, they love sin, they love darkness, they love evil, and they love fossil. In John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but men love darkness. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, the last uh, chapter of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 22 verse 15. For without a dogs and sorcerers and mongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Those who love lies, those who love false doctrine, and they say, I just like the way the man talks. I know that everything he says is not correct, but I like his, you know, appearance, I like his attitude, and it's never, you know, it just takes his time, and then he tells you every, and he's sweet, error is sweet. Poison is sweet. False doctrine is sweet. They love a lie and they love falsehood. And that's what is destroying those local churches. And I pray that this church will not get destroyed by that in Jesus' name. That's how the pollution came in. But the Lord is telling us what to do. Come out of that pollution. And come out of that evil thing. Revelation chapter 18. In Revelation chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4. It says in verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. I pray we'll hear the word of God. We come to point number three now, the preservation of the true church in his word. The preservation of the true church in his word. Is this word of God that will preserve us? Is this word of God that will preserve the church? We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 20 verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you what? All the counsel of God. Looks like you have not opened your Bible. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 verse 27. Now we're going to read that together. One, two, three, go. All the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. I pray will not be partial in declaring and giving the word of God in Jesus' name. Verse 28, take it therefore unto yourselves. You see, when the temptation comes to not to say that because, uh, you know, so and so is there. Not to say that because, you know, there are some newcomers here today who cannot preach the whole word of God. And not to say the word of God, preach the word of God because, uh, you know, there, there's somebody there. If we preach it like that, he may not come again. Are we trying to swell the crowd on earth? Are we preparing people for heaven? Take it therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. We're coming to First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 15. First Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 15. Meditate upon these things. All these things we're hearing today. Meditate on them. Think of them. Roll it over in your mind. Apply them to your own life. Think through on them. And make the personal application and compare it with your own ministry. And compare it with the way you declare the word of God. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. That thy profiting may appear to all. Take it unto thyself and unto thee doctrine continue in them you will continue yes. for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee first timothy second timothy chapter one second timothy chapter one verse 13 hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me 
Paul the apostle was not ashamed to say, you've heard it of me. Why? Because in it, it was the word of God. It was all the counsel of God. And he told the Timothy just like I'm telling you. And I pray that as Timothy obeyed, you too, you'll obey. It says, hold fast. Don't hold with loose hand. Because if you hold it with loose hand, you'll find something that appears more appealing, more interesting. And it's not everything that glitters that is gold. And then you'll drop what you are holding with a loose hand. But it says, hold fast, hold firmly, hold grip it with all your heart and with all your mind. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and in love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing, the word of God is good. The doctrine of the Bible is good. And all these uh, challenges and the testimony of Paul the Apostle, they are good. And I pray you'll find them good in your life in Jesus' name. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. I charge thee therefore, before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. You will do it. Amen. Preach the word. I said you will do it. Amen. At every opportunity, you are talking to an individual, you are preaching to an individual, you are preaching to a family, and you are preaching to a household, you are preaching the house fellowship, you are preaching you know, in your local church anywhere. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, without long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, you know, but after their own law shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But, what did it say there? Watch thou in all things, endure affliction. Don't say because of a little difficulty, a little challenge, a little pressure, then I cannot say that anymore. They are not even putting us in prison today. You see, the preachers of those days, like Paul the Apostle, like Silas, they locked them up, they beat them, they did quite a lot of terrible things to them, but all the same, they held on. You will hold on. But watch thou in all things and do afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, we're reading from verses 4 and 5. Acts, chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were at Jerusalem. At Jerusalem, they gave uh, Paul the Apostle and Silas and these people, they gave them the word of God from the headquarters. And then everywhere they went, every city they went they delivered them as decree they delivered them as something you cannot change you cannot alter you cannot uh, you know uh, tamper with it says in that verse 4 and as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep that they ordained that were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were Jerusalem and so were the churches established in the faith the Lord will establish our churches. And then it says, they increased in number daily. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Notice that this Apollos was already mighty in the scripture. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, and he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak at boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto themselves and expounded unto him the way of God. Tell me. 
more perfectly. He was ready fervent. He knew the scriptures, confident and bold and courageous. But when they, they saw the limitation, and the same thing, when you hear people, maybe they are sincere, maybe they are bold, maybe they are authoritative, maybe they, they are fervent. But when you hear them, you know their limitation. And the reason why God is raising you up like Aquila, raising you up like Priscilla, is so that when you see such people, you draw them near, and then you expand the word of God to them more perfectly, you'll do it in Jesus' name. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, uh, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, remember, they have helped him, remember, they have developed him, remember, they have trained him, remember, they had expanded the word of God to him more perfectly. Now, he, turned everywhere he went, he helped them much, which had believed through grace. Welcome to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. It tells us here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, uh, uh, very clearly it says, uh, Do all things, tell me, without murmurings and without disputings, no argument. Once the word of God comes out, that's the word of God. We read it and you can, it's your Bible there. There's no murmuring and there's no dispute in Jesus' name. That she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. What do you hold forth? In preaching, what do you hold forth? In your counseling, what do you hold forth? In your advice, what do you hold forth? Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Jude, one chapter, Jude, we're looking at verse 3. In Jude, reading from verse 3, beloved, what I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exalt you that you should, how do you contend? Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The Lord has exposed the word of God to us once again today. And the Lord has reminded us that if the local church is going to remain a church of saved people, a church of redeemed people, a church of sanctified people, the preachers have a lot to do with it. The workers have a lot to do with it. And what are we to do? One, prepare. Uh, one, preach the truth and feed the church. Feed the truth, uh, feed the church by preaching the truth. No error, no falsehood, no adaptation, no alteration, and there's no change. Preach the truth and feed the church. Number two, prepare for teaching and edify the church. If you're coming to preach, you have to prepare. And you can tell by the grace of God, when I come to you anytime, whether it is Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Saturday or Sunday, I prepare. I don't just say, uh, you know, carry the Bible or I don't have time to read, uh, you know, the Sunday scripture or the building the body and then I just come. There's some people that do that. And you can tell what they are teaching, uh, that they are not in control of what they are teaching because they have not prepared but prepare for teaching so you can edify the church number three purge your tongue and uplift the church put your tongue. You see, there are some, maybe there are some things to just say glibly. There are some things that come out of your mouth, but it, it doesn't really add to the value and the weight of, and the authority of what you are teaching. You purge your tongue and uplift the church. Number four, purify the temple and honor the church. Purify the temple, your own temple. Purify that temple. And the temple of God, like you know, our temple here tonight, very neat and very calm, and everybody sitting orderly. You honor that temple, purify the temple, and honor the church. Number five. 
part with trivialities, things that are frivolous, things that are tr tr trivial. You, you part with them, part with trivialities and strengthen the church. The things, the non-essentials, the unimportant things. Don't allow, you know, somebody is uh, feeling heat, uh, you know, is uh, having some trivialities. Somebody is, uh, you know, feeling a little bit hungry, therefore, because of that in a hurry, and he doesn't do a thorough job in the word of God, part with trivialities and strengthen the church perfect the teachers perfect the teachers those who are going to teach if you're a group pastor call them and find out how have they prepared what have they prepared what are they going to give and if you are a coordinator in a district a pastor those who are leading us fellowship you are a women rep those who are leading us fresh among the women you will perfect the teachers and transform the church so that there'll be seriousness there'll be devotion there'll be spirituality number seven preserve the treasure and present the church holy preserve the treasure this treasure of the word of god we have got you preserve it you will not allow it to die down at your doorstep and then number eight finally propagate the truth and multiply the church propagate the truth and multiply the church the lord will help you the Lord has raised you up and you will stand firm on this word of God in Jesus' name. You will not lose your reward. I said you will not lose your reward. Look at Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. It will keep you from falling. You will not fall into sin. You will not fall into error. You'll not fall into carelessness. You'll not fall into compromise. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present your faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has revealed so much to us tonight in our training. We need to take that to the Lord in prayer. Forget every other thing now and concentrate on how these things will become part of your life, will become part of your soul, part of your spirit, and this will help you to render greater service to the Lord, more acceptable service unto the Lord. Pray and the Lord will improve on your ministry and your ministry will impart other people better in Jesus' name.